Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Gabe Kapler, and I'm the manager of the San Francisco Giants. Uh, first, a little bit more about both of our organizations. Um, here at Pipeline for Change, we are focused on providing resources and removing obstacles for BIPOC, women, non-binary people, and members of the LGBTQ plus community participate in sports. The Pipeline for Change Foundation is committed to building an environment where every facet of the game is filled with diverse decision makers, leading to a richer and more representative game and a more just society. A little bit about the Giants Community Fund. In a very similar vein, for the last three decades, the Giants Community Fund has dedicated their work to making opportunities for youth to play ball more accessible donating over $40 million to community efforts and serving over 400,000 youth across California, Oregon, and Nevada. Using baseball and softball as the vehicle, the fund seeks to promote health, education, and character development to empower youth to be giants on the field, in the classroom, and in the community. So the goal is simple. Uh, for everybody on this call, we want to use our platform of professional sports for social change by, by uniting experts across the industry to speak on crucial and timely societal topics. And today we're starting with a topic that is not always openly discussed in our clubhouses and locker rooms, that's mental health. And before we dive into today's conversation, I do want to provide a trigger warning that we will be discussing topics surrounding suicide, drug use, and related topics. So please take care of yourself as we navigate this uh, challenging conversation together. Um, at this point, I wanted to quickly share an anecdote in the form of a text that I received this morning. And I asked uh, this player, this former um, major league player with the San Francisco Giants, if I could uh, share this text, he gave me permission, and I think it's a good jumping off point. So he says, hey, Cap, I wanted to talk to you about something that's been on my mind for over a year now, and I never got to do it in person last spring training. This time period was the only time I was sober. The only time I was sober was when I was at the field, and even some days I was not sober there. I was getting high every day and it was really affecting my control over my emotion, over my emotions and my logical thinking. That day in the city that he mentions, when y'all optioned me, I wasn't sober, I was high. That was the reason I didn't wanna talk with you at the hotel. I couldn't control myself. I'm embarrassed to admit that I have this problem and I let it leak into my professional career, but I've been sober for over a year now and I'm better because of it. I know you're extremely busy, so I didn't want to burden you with this call, burden you with a call over this matter. It's been on my mind now for some time, and I wanted to reach out to you about it. Hope all is well and best of luck this upcoming season. So I share this anecdote and this text uh, because I think it's a good example of how mental health uh, challenges the most remarkable professional athletes and how we need to treat mental health in the same way we treat physical health. This player that reached out to me needed help. He didn't feel confident enough to ask for that help. And, you know, I, as the leader at that moment, um, wasn't able to step up because that stigma existed. So I feel like this is a good opportunity to introduce a, a very special panel, a panel that uh, is filled with people that I, I very much respect. So I'm going to start with Alyssa Nacken. Alyssa is one of our coaches um, at the San Francisco Giants and um, a close personal friend. Drew Robinson is one of our mental health experts at the Giants. And uh, Drew is leading the charge in, in raising awareness around our clubhouse and throughout our, our organization. 
And Darren Waller is a New York Giants tight end um, in the NFL. And Darren has uh, his own expertise on the matter. And I just feel like this is the group that's going to have a, a good discussion, raise some awareness and, and, and shine a spotlight on this very important matter. So I was hoping to kind of go around the horn, share a little bit about why mental health, both in sports and society, is important to each of us. And Drew, if you're, if you're open to it, if you could lead us off, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, where do you start, right? But um, I just think it's one of those topics, again, that has become so uncomfortable and so so unrecognized and so untalked about that um, it easily just gets put on a back burner um, when, re when realistically it's it's a huge contributor to our overall well-being at, at, at every given moment. So it's something that I'm going through my own struggles um, and having to learn a very hard way that I needed, needed to address it and heal some things and, and talk about it more often. Um, it's something I should have been doing a long time ago and it's something that should be so much more regular than it is. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's just, it's still there. So that's why this important conversation, all the other important conversations that are being had around it really do help move the needle because the more and more I talk about this, the more and more I relating, I'm relating with people that I never really thought that I would be relating to because realistically, we're all going through a lot more similar things than we might realize. Drew, uh, when you heard me read that text um, from that player, did that like bring any any thoughts to mind about like our interactions um, when you were with us and, and on the field as a giant? Not that specific, but it did bring out like my own experience when I was a player for you in, in spring training. Um, it, it reminded me of like my exit meeting when I was, or my player plan meeting, um, how I like actually sh showed some vulnerability with you for the first time I had ever done with a coach before. Um, so it kind of brought me back to my own experience with like being in the, in the locker room and, and, and going through spring training while dealing with some significant um, and life-threatening uh, troubles. So, but it, it is a good point that like, it is another reminder that at every given moment, someone might, is dealing with something that we have no idea about. So like the idea of continuing to just offer like kindness and support and like non-judgmental ears and, and just like being there for, for each other and, and creating a safe space, um, it goes a long way. So I think the idea that we're all going through something that we might not be seeing or realizing is so evident. And every time I talk about it, it reminds me that like that is the case. Um, and it's something that Again, I, it could be on my at the front of my mind more often, and I think all of us realistically. Yeah, I, I mean, one thing that jumps out to me is that spring training, and now I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective on Drew uh, during that time period. Um, was that you just came across as so together, you know? So um, you looked confident, you know. You're you're a funny kind of easygoing guy. Um, like physically you're a handsome dude. Like you just stood out when you walked into a room and you could feel your presence. And I'm, I was just like, man, like this guy has it all together and he, and he's got it all. So um, it was, it was shocking to know that you were going through the things you were going through, the demons that you had. And I don't know, Nack, what was your perspective on Drew at that time? Very similar. I mean, it was the the first spring training I ever had a chance to work with you, Drew, and um, be around you. And I share like similar sentiments to Cap. I'm just thinking like this is a a, a stud athlete, a uh, professional baseball player, and has a lot going for him. And then you know we had the shutdown, COVID shut the shut spring training down, and um, we we put on like weekly outfield calls with all the players and all, all the outfielders in the organization. And Antoine Richardson, our first base coach was kind of leading the charge in that. And he always made time to ask like how everybody was doing. And I feel like that was kind of like the first time where I was like, wow, this is, this is a really important thing because the world is shut down. We've we're navigating something none of us have ever experienced before. So it's really cool that we offered that space in those settings. However, like now I just think, man, we should have gone even deeper and made it a little bit more individualized and personal. Um, Drew, I remember hearing that you had gotten a dog during the shutdown 
And I think then you, after just a couple of days, you either like gave it to somebody else or were going to take it back. Um, but you got the dog because you felt lonely. And I remember hearing that and, and then I just never like followed up to, to check in. And so, yeah, I don't know. I have a lot of feelings about that spring, but, um, it was shocking to hear just how, how dark of a space you were in during that time. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's a wild story. Um, a lot was going into it, but I think again, that's the importance of these conversations because the more I talk about this, the more, I guess like symptoms or examples or evidence of needing to address it come up more often. So I, I'm maybe at times I'm on too far on the, on the pendulum where I'm like thinking everything could be a red flag or a green flag or whatever. But um, again, it's, it is a learning lesson. And again, again, I think the more we talk about it, the more we realize there is things that could be showed in, in ways that don't seem as significant as they are. So um, I think that's why the importance of these conversations will really help others in an education way from people lived experience and just all, all the other things that you can get from it. Because again, we're all experiencing very similar feelings and emotions just from completely different stimulus and on much different level at any given time. Darren, can you talk a little bit about the, the culture in football? I mean, I think the three of us have this, um, you know, we have this, this exposure to baseball and there very much is uh, a, a toughness mentality where you're not supposed to show any weakness. You know, you're supposed to roll with the punches. You're supposed to grind. You're supposed to get through it. And just out of curiosity, do you have a similar, a similar feel for football? Yeah, I would. The football culture is, I mean, that in a nutshell. Uh, I've been playing football since I was four or five years old, and I feel like the culture has um, been based on those premises. You know, it wasn't there was no crying, there was no emotion being shown. Uh, all toughness was was being able to just bang your head up against uh, somebody time and time again. And um, you know, throughout my mental health journey, I've had to rechange, like, change what my definition of toughness was, and what a lot of things that I held uh, in high regard as far as values for a man because uh, the game that I played and then just the culture of men in general in society, um, the values that they placed on me and on a lot of men that are still playing this game today are not healthy for them or not do not allow them to be the best versions of themselves and to um, play the game and then go home and then have a life and be at peace in that life. There are a lot of guys that I see struggle and a lot of guys that see try to numb themselves out with substances just like I used to do and um, thinking that's the answer. And it's just sometimes you just want to shake guys and be like, no, there's a different way, you know? So it's uh, it's it's still a big deal and a big obstacle in the culture of football. And what what is that way? I mean, just, if there's a, there's a different way, I'm not sure. I mean, I have some a sense of where you might be going with it, but we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I think first it starts with uh, vulnerability, like I said, of of changing a definition of toughness, toughness uh, before and strength before was concealing all that and holding it away. And uh, I'm a man, I do it on my own. Uh, I don't need anybody's help where now I view strength as asking for help, as speaking exactly what's on your mind and what you're feeling. Um, also showing compassion to yourself, which is a word that is completely foreign to uh, men historically. And even today, really, um, you know, just understanding yourself, loving yourself. Like these are terms that seem so feminine to men, but um, I feel like it, it's time for us to push this charge because I don't feel like people, you know, losing their life or just not having any type of peace is worth um, not adopting a feminine type of quality or a feminine type of value. So um, that's the way that it's changed for me. What was, sorry, can I ask a question? <laughs> what was that turning point for you, Darren? And um, who was kind of around you or what, what led you to learn and dive a little bit deeper on the concepts of compassion and vulnerability and, and things like that? Um, the main driving factor was uh, overdosing on uh, opiates. Uh, Painkillers was my main drug of choice, mixing that with alcohol and really whatever anything that could give me a high or change the way that I was feeling, change the way that I thought about myself at any given moment in time was what I would turn to. 
And so that overdose just kind of sat me down and I was just like, to this point, I thought I knew what I was doing. I thought I was in control. I thought I had all the answers to uh, bring myself peace. But all I've ever, all I've ended up doing is putting myself in this place where there's nothing but chaos going on on the inside of me and I'm just lonely and have no hope. So it's going to rehab and learning how to meditate, um, learning how to journal, uh, being honest in a one-on-one -on -one setting with therapists, group therapy settings, um, going to 12-step meetings, uh, rekindling a relationship with God, like all of these things that force me to stop and look inward because a lot of the times we're just going, accomplishing, achieving, moving forward, and we never stop to look at ourselves. So that was a moment for me to sit still and be like, I've never prioritized what's going on, on the inside of me ever until this point. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for asking. Hey, Nack, I was curious if uh, when we're in when we're in the clubhouse and you're kind of witnessing players, uh, how how often do you feel like guys reach out to you for support and and to chat about some of the things that that Darren was talking about? Mm, um, it's like I I think collectively the players feel like I'm a pretty safe space to talk through a lot of things that are going on um, off the field also on the field and in the clubhouse just kind of all aspects of life there are a handful that will dive a little bit deeper into some of these like darker feelings and um, just kind of like that kind of thing and I think what's what's a what's beautiful about our clubhouse is that with players and past players like Drew and then um, Shana Alexander, our EAP and others and you Cap, just your leadership on how out front of mental health that you and we are, guys for the most part, like feel really safe to talk through, through things, not just with me, but any of our coaches. And I think all of us coaches feel like, yes, we're we're helping prepare these guys on the field every single day. But a majority of our time with these guys is spent talking through whatever is going on kind of outside the field. Drew, can you can you speak a little bit to that? I mean, obviously you're around the clubhouse a ton and um Drew, Drew is at the clubhouse now uh, quite a bit. And so he's, Alyssa is a resource. As Alyssa mentioned, Shana Alexander is a resource. We have other resources as well. Uh, but I think Drew may be a, as big as any. And, and a lot of that has to do with being able to relate to a lot of the things that our players who are dealing with, things like depression and anxiety, um, you can relate to them. So can you speak to that a little bit, Drew? Yeah, again, I think that like that that connection, that relatability that we're all a lot more likely to realize comes into play a lot. Um, but specifically with baseball, it's like I tell the guys that or when we get going in conversation, it comes up pretty often. It's like I kind of experienced every little part of baseball besides like superstardom. I mean, I had a very long minor league career. I got to experience big leagues for a little bit. I I was up and down guy. I was the like that 25th, 26th roster guy. So I was kind of in other areas. I was starting for a little bit um played in winter ball so I, I i feel like i'm able to kind of connect with a little bit of everybody in baseball um and then with my story being so public i think it adds an element of just that safe space idea to where guys feel a little more comfortable to saying like either me too or do you think that this is a sign of this or whatever it, it really start, it really kick starts the conversation into more than just that surface level conversation that we have um, most days and i think it's something that I feel incredibly grateful to be in that position. Um, I, I know it's a very rare position to be in to like really see the reality and the wholeness of somebody and hear about it and how they're perceiving things or experiencing things. Um, because realistically, it, it just sets up a really deep connection um, with that person, which, like I said, I think the more vulnerable, like Darren said, that we can be, the more expedited a, a connection becomes. So I talk very passionately about I've gotten to know my friends that I was friends with like 10, 15 years before my attempt, um, I've gotten to know them more in the last three years than I did those 10, 15 years before. And then the people I've come across now, I feel like I'm, I've known them for so long. So I think that it's just a sign of like that connection and that that safe space really does go a long way to where it is just like a relatable concept and there's no judgment attached to it. And it's just like, how can we get these things out 
um, in a more productive way to either free up space in the future or to like realize there's things that could be um, addressed a little bit more specifically to maybe heal some things that um, I feel passionate about that will come out in some way, um, whether we're aware of it or not. So in my own experiences, I, I know that there was a lot of things that I was doing that were coming from a place of projection as opposed to me actually wanting to do it. And then I'd go home and really regret doing it and feel like it wasn't who I was kind of thing. So a little off topic there, but I just think that that, that conversation about real things in that safe space concept, it just goes such a long way. And I'm, I know from firsthand, like how real and how realistic it is for it to happen because I, it's, happens to me every time I'm at the field. <laughs> I, I would assume, Drew, that there's at least some people uh, who are following on Facebook Live or, or maybe even on the call that don't, don't know your story. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you feel comfortable, maybe sharing a little bit about that would, would go a long way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I play, I, I grew up in Las Vegas. I was fortunate enough to play baseball and eventually get drafted. Um, and played parts of 12 professional seasons with parts of three being at the major league level. Um, so I had everything that I wanted um, from a career standpoint, right? Um, I had a supportive friend group and family. Um, on the outside, I was living my dream. Um, but unfortunately, I got to a place internally where I felt like I was kind of fooling everybody and things just really started weighing on me and going unaddressed and again, kind of getting trapped in the stigma unknowingly and trying to act like I had everything under control and everything figured out, um, mixed with a couple of acute circumstances that happened in a couple of months at the end of 2019 and in 2020, and then the pandemic happening really threw me into a spiral and unfortunately attempted to, to end my life um, on April 16th of 2020, which um, fortunately I survived obviously, and fortunately also coming out of it with a, a sense of, I have nothing to lose, nothing to hold back anymore. I know the reality of what can happen if I keep doing this. So let me just be me and, and be honest. And luckily was in a position to find my purpose in a public way to try to help people get a, avoid getting to that place, that place because I know um, in the most real way possible what it feels like. So my wish is to kind of talk about my experiences and the lessons learned or my mistakes, however they want to perceive it um, in a way to hopefully help no one else in the world feel the way that I was feeling the months leading up to April 16th. I appreciate that. Darren, what, what about yours? Like, how did it, how did it start for you? Um, I can trace my mental health journey back to or elementary school. Almost. Uh, I remember one of the first memories of pain that I had was, um, I would be consistently told that I wasn't black enough by people that were, my skin color growing up and um, no amount of, I played three, four sports and was successful at all of them. They couldn't change the fact that I wasn't black enough. I'd got good grades in school, couldn't change the fact that I wasn't black enough. And so I adopted this narrative as truth that um, I just wasn't good enough at my core. Like, and I always had to do things or please people uh, to get to these places. And then, you know, I'm in the NFL now, but my freshman, sophomore year of high school, I rode the bench playing football. And that was like what I was clinging to for my identity. And from there, I just got, I was desperate for, you know, something to just allow me to take a deep breath, allow me to just feel like everything wasn't crashing and burning. And uh, I always said I would never do drugs. I wanted to walk the straight and narrow and, you know, and live a good life or whatever. But that's why I have so much, um, empathy and compassion for people that go that route now because I just wanted to change the way that I felt. I didn't want to be a bad person. I didn't want to get arrested three times. I didn't want to get suspended from every level of athletics I've ever been on. Um, I just wanted to feel better. I just didn't want to consistently put myself down and rev the thoughts of uh, negativity at a thousand miles per hour at all times. And so I started using when I was 15. Um, start drinking shortly after smoking weed, all that, just trying to, you know, numb the pain of the, like the truth that I convinced myself that I was, was, and never would be good enough. And that followed me through, uh, playing football at Georgia tech to graduating from Georgia tech in three and a half years to go into the NFL, being drafted. Um, and I'm going into my eighth season and, um, just 
and my overdose was going to be when my third NFL season was and being out of the league and going to work at Sprouts and, you know, getting sober through all those things, coming back to the league, being a Pro Bowl player, like none of those things, uh, like just because my story kind of turned around, there was success that came from it. There was purpose that came from it. Um, it's still a battle for me to this day. You know, I'm, uh, I'm the highest paid player at my position in the league, but I'm still nervous every day I go out to practice that if I drop a pass, they're going to send me backpacking. You know, I'm like, why am I building a house there? I'm not going to be able to afford it. You know, I still have thoughts like that. I can still spin out sometimes. So it's just a daily a fight and a daily uh, battle just to stay conscious to those things and not shame myself for having certain thoughts and looking at myself a certain way. And, uh, you know, just and keep fighting the fight, keep trying to show love and compassion to myself. But uh, it began at a very early age and uh, I can still see how that inner child wants to uh, come out and react to certain things, even at 30, about to be 31 soon. Darren, what are some of those techniques that you use? So when you, when you are going out to practice and still feeling so nervous that if you drop a pass, you're going to be sent out. Um, how do you overcome that? What are some of the lessons that you've learned or things you think about or anything physical that you do to overcome that? Um, uh, I, I usually call it like a, a, a series of reminders. I'll uh, I'll watch highlights of myself and affirm myself for things that I've done. Uh, I, I've noticed the power of uh, speaking out loud to myself because mm -hmm. uh, I write affirmations down. I uh, you know write down what I'm grateful for. I, I do a lot of writing. That's something that I love to do. But um, saying things out loud is uh, difficult for me. And most difficult things in my life, if I do those things they usually end up in improvement. Um, so it's it's saying those things out loud. Like if I, and telling myself, I'm a great player. I bring a lot to this team, whether I have the statistics to show for it or not. Um, I'm much more valuable than my performance. I have to say these things out loud, say them in the mirror, um, you know, making sure I'm taking deep breaths. I'll do some box breathing at practice in between reps, in between periods. It's just like, bring that moment to moment because 30 minutes can go by. I could be doing all my routine, but 30 minutes can go by and I'm not conscious to just the little things that I do. It, uh, things can start to turn in a way that I don't want them to. So it's just really being conscious to my breath, um, saying things to myself out loud and really just engaging with the people around me. Because usually when um, I'm thinking those thoughts, I'm in my own head or I'm trying to get something for myself. I'm trying to perform a certain way, be seen a certain way. Whereas if I go and have genuine conversations with my teammates or go give somebody a high five or, you know, amp them up and just be a part of the community, be a part of the greater good of what's going on around me, I'm less likely to be fixated on myself and be um, so worried about what's going on in my head. So just simple things like that. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. And um, yeah, I know you've mentioned a couple of times that you like writing. And so I, I really hope that you continue to write because this story is beautiful and I feel like so many people can learn from it and um, hearing it is great, but I also think your written word on it will be beautiful to see one day if that's in the cards for you. Thank you. That means a lot. Man, yeah, I, I like the talking out loud aspect of that. <laughs> I, sometimes I kind of like catch myself thinking like, man, if someone were to ever walk around my, put a camera in my house when I'm here by myself and catch myself like saying like kind of corny things out loud or what feel I felt like corny at first, saying them out loud to just kind of like hype myself up or remind myself when I kind of start feeling irritable. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I do that out, yeah, out in public sometimes too, like just sell, sell it to myself, like this is not a me problem kind of thing. Um, but I, I feel like that, that saying it out loud for me, like the physical hearing part of anything is so convincing. So sometimes when I'm being irrational internally, when I go into my therapy sessions and I start speaking out loud about how my week has been, I hear myself like just physically hearing it. Like that's not how I think about things. So I think the, the power of saying things out loud goes a lot, goes a long way, even though it can feel kind of weird at first. What's a common phrase that you've been saying to yourself lately, Drew? um that has nothing to do with me <laughs> hmm. a lot I mean especially nowadays with social media um going out in the public like I one of my maybe 
parts of my shadow work that I'm not so proud of is at times I can get very judgmental um, with myself or with things I'm seeing. So um, reminding myself pretty often that that has nothing to do with me and I don't have to engage or I don't have to like let it ruin my next couple minutes or my next, the rest of my day kind of thing. Um, that and like really just saying some kind of acceptance, something to do with acceptance. Like I, I fall into trap of trying to control things that don't need to be controlled and usually getting pretty ir irritated about it when I can't. So um, some form of like accepting something for the way it is. Um, those, those are the two most common in the last, like I would say two weeks. Yeah. Darren, have you found yourself in a, in now that you're eight years in the league, you, as you mentioned, the highest paid player at, at your position, um, do you find yourself in like a mentor role, like looking for, you know, younger athletes that are now listening to you, to talk to yourself, probably wondering what that means and like trying to emulate you? Do you have those conversations? Uh, yeah, I do. And I'm actually seeking them out more now that uh, I feel like, um, you know, my, my confidence is it can waver sometimes, but I feel like my conviction and what I bring to the table outside of my performance has grown. So I, I, I go to those conversations more. Like there's some rookies that are in the building now and they came up to me and they're like, hey man, you really, like you're really sober? Like you don't smoke gas or nothing? Like you don't do none of that? And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I'm like really sober. And like, man, like how, how do you do it? Or there's a new tight end, um, his name's Ryan Jones. He's a undrafted guy. He's on our, uh, just got signed to us and he's trying to learn the offense. And you can tell it's just like, whoa, like things are just going a million miles per hour. And, uh, and I'm just trying to help him out with, you know, certain routes and just tell him, hey, man, be patient with yourself. Um, uh, telling these guys like, hey, I didn't my time to prove myself in a starting position wasn't until my fifth season. There was a lot of turmoil. There was a lot of failure. There was a lot of um, all these things. Just try to be vulnerable with them, because I know that there aren't a ton of guys that have come before me that were vulnerable or felt in a place to where they could just show their scars and uh, not feel like they were going to be used against them in a way. Whereas now I'm, you know, I'm convinced that, you know, my, though my confidence, like I said, can be shaky. I, I know that uh, I bring a lot to the table and I, my, my skill set and just me being myself creates room for myself and whether a certain team wants me or not, like wherever I go, I feel like what God has blessed me with can make room for myself. So I'm willing to be that much more vulnerable to guys and, and give them the real and let them know that hey, we need a sense of urgency in how we work, but at the same time, be patient with yourself because, you know, this process isn't going to go exactly how you want it to go, and it may weigh on you at times, but I feel like the only way you can lose in this thing is if you if you stop, if you, if you, if you quit, if you um, just stop trying, you know? So I feel like just telling these guys, hey, man, just show up and show yourself a little grace and, and, and trust who you are because you made it here for a reason. And I feel like just simple conversations like that go a long way and just give them a high five if they mess something up, you know, just make sure I'm there to be one of the first people to pick them up. Mm -hmm. Darren, you kind of touched on like um, the concept of like inner child stuff. And you even mentioned that a lot of this started back like elementary school when people were saying that you weren't black enough and that sort of thing. Um, Drew, I'm curious, and you might have touched on it, but did did these like negative thoughts and thoughts that you're not good enough and th things that like you you can't do it kind of start at a young age, maybe like elementary school age or anything related to like family dynamics while growing up? Or did all of it stem from entering like a high level of baseball? No, yeah, it was definitely uh, child childhood. Um... I was smiling a lot when Darren was um, describing his upbringing um, because I saw so many similarities. Um, again, it was like different contexts and different circumstances, but it, it created a, a very similar feeling of not good enough or just like needing to always prove myself um, for that element. Like growing up in my brothers, uh, I was a younger brother to kind of like just a, a beast, like a prodigy at every age that he, age group that he was in. He was always way bigger, taller, stronger than everybody. If it wasn't for an injury in high school, he probably would have been a top five pick, throwing like 100 miles an hour. I come in, I, I'm the exact opposite. I'm like miniature for my, for my age at every level. I'm a backup in, in Little League, backup on my travel ball team. Um, so kind of like that concept of just always trying to keep up with my brother. And in that moment, there was a lot of times where I was just like, 
I was just happy to be around my brother, like learning from him and like enjoying the time that my parents forced my brother to, to make for me to come hang out with their friends. But um, I think that kind of lingered into or turned into this idea that like I'm I'm way behind and like I have to prove myself in every aspect at every time or every moment in my life. So um, it just created this like never enough kind of concept. Um, there's always more to be done. And like when things go well, that's fine, but there's more to be to, to have. So it's never like similar to Darren. I was just never present in most moments. And I never thought of the idea that I needed to like accept myself because I thought if I did, it would just take from this work ethic and it would go all the way to complete complacency instead of like there's a neutral ground of like acceptance and and work work ethic. Um, and then, yeah, the, the family dynamic was always tough. I mean, I grew up in a household where my parents didn't like each other. They were in a tough relationship. They didn't really like each other for the first um, parts of my life. Eventually got a divorce and then the divorce was just really ugly. Like a lot of um, finger pointing and trying to convince the kids who's the better side and, and things like that. So um, it just got really tough. And I, I just learned that I can always like leave situations like physically. And so I think that caused some inner discomfort when I became an adult, because when, when, when things hit the fan and adversity hit, I just needed, I just wanted to like break something or get out of there because I had to like learn how to make my own happiness when I was a kid. And then for that, for me, it was sports. I'm always trying to prove myself. And once you get to a professional level, you just can't prove yourself to be perfect really at all. But even lesser than when you're in like travel ball in high school and stuff. So sitting on the bench my first years of high school, just like Darren in baseball uh, was so like crazy to hear from your, your perspective because that was similar to me. I felt like my high school coach was kind of like let down that I showed up being like five foot 95 pounds. My brother just left being like six, six, two fifty, throwing hundred miles an hour. It's like, what, this is the next Robinson boy kind of thing. So um, I think that those things kind of shaped some, some inner conflict that I didn't really know was happening in that moment. And then what I said earlier about like things just coming out, whether we like it or not, I was such aware of my heart and my sleep kind of kid that when things were not going well, I just needed to get it out. So like, I was always a kid that like slammed my glove, slammed my bat, was crying in little league and things like that. And unfortunately that also followed me into adulthood where I was aware of my heart and my sleep kind of guy, because I just couldn't find any kind of stability. So um, it's a very common thing in therapy work is, channeling our inner child or showing some love and compassion to our inner child that still shows up even though we're grown grown adults and stuff so um, that's something that I'm constantly reminded of as well when I kind of fall off track a little bit mm. so there's a, a lot of self-doubt like a theme of self-doubt both of you guys high level professional athletes um, and I'm just curious uh, Nat what did you experience first couple years with with the giants in uh in the clubhouse if any of that popped up for you to all the time um yeah self-doubt i feel like is just like hanging out right here every single day um over the years i've grown to like appreciate it because it allows me to never settle and um so i look at it as kind of like a like a workout, like I'm constantly training this muscle of getting over the self-doubt that inevitably is just going to be around me all the time. Um, in the first couple of years in, in this role, uh, a question that people ask me a lot in interviews and, and just out in public really, it was like, what's the hardest part? Or like, who's the hardest person to deal with? Or like things like that. And honest, and this is like, swear on everything. This is the, the truth. It's like my own insecurities are the hardest thing that I deal with every single day. I feel like I can um, handle anything anybody says to me, any anything that's happening around me. But um, the, just the, that my own insecurity is just get in the freaking way. <laughs> um, but I, I do appreciate it because again, like it makes me stronger and it allows me to connect with people and players in a way that I think, you know, when I first started, I didn't really look at it that way, but to Darren's point about just like vulnerability and compassion, um, having self-doubt or insecurities and being able to connect with the player in that has made my relationships with the players a lot stronger. I didn't play professional baseball. Like I, I don't know what it's like to face 98. Like I cannot connect on 
that level with any of our players. And, and I'm very like happy to admit that, but I can connect on like a deep level when it comes to the, the self-doubt or, you know, being in the spotlight and feeling like you're not going to live up to the expectations that society or your family or all of the young people looking up to you have put on you. Um, and just to be able to break down those walls between myself and a player, I feel like goes a long way. Um, but yeah, I think self-doubt, we all have it. And I think a lot of society's problems actually stem from insecurity. And I think the more that people are able to admit some of their insecurities, we'd be living in a lot healthier of a world. Reach. <laughs> Thanks. So, so def definitely true. And um, so dealing with insecurity, some of the methods that we, we all have to deal with them. Just wanted to quickly say, um, my dad died in 2020, same year as, as Drew's attempt. And it was a pretty tough year for, I think, a lot of people. And for the first time um, in this way, I, I reached out because I needed, I needed some support and some help. Uh, to, to deal with the grieving process. And a lot of it was, I just couldn't feel anything at all and just wanted to kind of wanted to feel something. So uh, I was working on that, uh, but along the same lines of, you know, insecurity, self-doubt, what are your, what are some of your experiences with, with therapy? Is that something that has been useful in your life? Would you recommend it? Drew, you want to start? Yeah, I would love to. Yeah. I mean, I, I've done, I've committed to therapy weekly for the last three years and, um, I haven't missed one. Um, and at when times, when things get a little off track, like I said earlier, when I start falling, um, like slipping a little bit, I'll schedule multiple sessions. I have a life coach that I approach the same way, um, with just the importance of creating spaces and, and learning spaces. So, I mean, like I said earlier, I think just the power of hearing what is happening inside from my mouth to another person sometimes helps. Like it just kind of like clears some space. And again, sometimes I'm just hearing that I'm being, I'm, I'm, I'm making, I'm catastrophizing things or I'm what I'm feeling like I'm believing inside that actually isn't in line with like my character or my morals. Um, and then also it's a space to kind of reinforce the good. So I think that's another thing that I'm pretty passionate about when I'm talking, when I'm talking about mental health and therapy work is like, it's not only for crisis moments. Like sometimes it's about going in there and reinforcing some of the good and some of the things that you're proud of, of yourself. So I just think it's such a, such a untapped into place to bring out the best version of yourself um and it'll sh it shows up in so many different ways like i said i feel like i don't know i before my before i started addressing these things i would i would stutter like talking to someone that i wasn't super comfortable with i would get incredibly nervous and anxious doing an interview with like one little camera after a game and now like people tell me like i'm such a good speaker and it's just like it blows my mind but i think it's it stems from therapy work um, because I'm, I'm creating a place that the at times forced to articulate what I'm feeling. And then I get that clarity and that understanding internally as well. So when I go to a different setting, um, it comes out in a much more authentic and clear way. Um, and then again, like I said, it's a really safe place to address the things that aren't so pretty of our lives and work on growing some of the things that we're not proud of or some of the regrets that we've made and heal those a little bit to continue forward and to not let them hinder, you know, the present moment and to linger into the future of creating something that sabotages your everydayness. So like I said, I, I can talk about therapy forever, <laughs> obviously, but I, I just think it's such a tool that can be utilized and it doesn't need to be this huge life-changing event every single time, but it's something that can be a part of the process to help bring out our best version, but on a more consistent basis. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I studied psychology in, in, um, college and always thought that I would be a therapist. And we, when I was in high school, um, like freshman, sophomore year, so early in high school, um, one of my great, good, best friends, even to this day was just going through like a lot, I guess, um, you know, your, four, your 14 year old girl just 
trying to navigate the world. And so there was just a lot that she's going through that I wasn't really like understanding at that time. Um, and she was put on, on some intense medications at a fairly young age. And I just kind of watched her over the years, like take more and more of these types of medications to just help kind of like limit the anxiety, but then she'd have to take something else to limit the side effects that that pill was giving her. And it was just this like crazy spiral of stuff. Um, I need to be very clear that I think medication when it comes to mental health is very important. Um, it's not for everybody, but it is for a lot of people. Um, but at that point, when, you know, 14, 15 years old, I just remember thinking like, man, I feel like they resorted to medication just so, so fast. And this was, you know, well before people were talking about therapy or the benefits of exercise and how it relates to and, and can positively impact your men mental health. Uh, but it's because of her journey and watching that and just seeing her, her body and her mind just kind of like give up at times because of all of these crazy things she was taking. And, um, so I wanted to go on and, and study psychology in school and, and do something that meant like, I don't need to just give somebody medication, but I can help them figure out ways to, to move their body or shift things in their lives to make themselves feel a little bit better. Um, and I, I learned a little bit of it in school, but even in, at that point, it was just like, I wasn't necessarily like getting what I was looking for, even though I wasn't sure what I was looking for. I just wanted, I just had all this faith in whatever it was. Like, I believe that there's a way that we can all just go into every single day feeling really good. And in those moments of times where we're feeling like um, not the best versions of ourselves, I truly believe that there are things that we can do to um, kind of navigate those dark times and get us back to those more like even keeled times. And it's something I'm still, would still like, like to learn more of, but you know, when you're in college and you're playing sports, you're kind of just going for the sports at times. Um, so I didn't really pursue it, but life experience in the last decade has just taught me a lot and also introduced me to a lot of people that kind of bridge together this concept of like, psychiatry and psychology, but also spirituality. Um, so I, I feel like I have all these like little gurus in my corner. Um, I have been to a therapist. I don't go regularly, but in the off season, it's just a great time to kind of do like a reflect um, of the season and what to expect in the off season, because that transition is, is pretty wild, um, definitely for players. But for us too, as coaches, like for nine months, your life is uh, all about baseball, all about like the ups and downs of a season and all about the, you know, 40 people that are in your clubhouse, the players, the staff, everything and dealing with the media and, and all that. Then all of a sudden the season's over and the off season comes and it's like, oh, wow, I don't really need to be anywhere. And you kind of go through this like identity crisis <laughs> and it can be sometimes kind of dark because you get out of your rhythm. Um, so I appreciate like seeing like an actual pro professional to just talk through a lot and like, get me back on my feet. But I also look to, um, you know, a lot of people in our clubhouse, actually, we have a hum human performance coach. We also have, you know, Dr. Alexander and, and other coaches that I feel like I can definitely be very, very vulnerable with and learn some techniques to kind of help on the mental side of things. Um, and then outside of my life or outside of the, like the baseball world, I feel like there are other, um, you know, people like neighbors that have turned into somewhat therapists for me. And it, again, it comes back to what we talked about in the beginning. There's this idea of like a safe space that you share with somebody and you're able to unlock some of that vulnerability and it allows you to just break down these walls and kind of work through some of like the weird stuff that goes on in your mind. So it was very long winded, but I do think that therapy is important and also finding like people in your life that aren't necessarily therapists, but that you can uh, tap into and kind of be really authentic with and, and grow with. 
I love, yeah. the way you ended, I love the way you ended that, Alyssa, because um, I have a unique therapy experience myself. I have a therapist who Drew actually introduced me to that I've been um, working with for a while now. But I've also had a, a, a sponsor um, just going through uh, and through my sobriety journey. So I have one angle of somebody that suffers from the disease of addiction, alcoholism like me. And then I also have my therapist who you know, really helps me with my perspective because, you know, I feel like with life as we go on and um, go about being our best selves and living as our best selves, um, it's going to bring about more challenges into our life. And there's a lot of good challenges, a lot of good challenges that keep flowing into my life. But uh, if I don't have the right perspective for those challenges, I can view them as burdens a lot of the times. And um, my therapist helps me a lot with um, challenging me with questions because, Naturally, I have an extreme reaction to things. Um, if I'm not the toughest guy in the room, I'm a wimp. If I'm not absolutely crushing it, I'm terrible. Um, and it's kind of helped me find, try to find a middle ground. So it's like once I go in there and I kind of like word vomit and all the puzzle pieces are out on the table, I feel like my therapist helps me to kind of move those pieces around. He doesn't move them for me. He doesn't, I don't just go in therapy and they hit a magic wand over me and then I'm healed because I went to therapy. But it, he helps guide me along in certain areas and help me want to explore different areas. And at the end, it's usually like, okay, journal about this. Okay. Meditate on this. Okay. Like, and let's, let's keep exploring, but um, it's great to have somebody to, you know, share these things with and not carry this load on me at all times. Because if I hide one thing, I'm more than likely to start hiding more things. And then when those things start to bottle up, it's going to come out in a way that I never intended for it to and that's going to continue the cycle of guilt and shame. And I don't want to live like that anymore. So that's why I still go to therapy. <laughs> Love that. Reach. Well, I, I appreciate I appreciate everybody's perspective. And uh, just to continue it just a little bit, if you guys are up for it, any any last words from each of you, anything that sort of was on your mind that you wanted to, to get through in this discussion? Um, would love to hear it. Yeah, I just feel like that last little bit about therapy and just like the work part of that goes into this, this, this part of the journey is, I think that's something that also helped me kind of free up some like commitment to it was like looking at it as an additive instead of like a full reshaping. So I always thought that like if I talked about something in a certain way, then kind of like the extreme idea that that's how I would do everything. That's how I would be known. So it's like, I can still be that like goofy, easygoing guy um, who's he, who's passionate about whatever, wears my heart, my sleeve, but I can also add in an element of therapy work and like doing the work to add a quality that I was missing in, in a more additive way and in an empowering way instead of, again, having to learn it the hard way. So I think for anyone who's like might be struggling, might not be wanting to, to you know, start the process is just know that you can still be who be the parts of you that you're proud of right now, but also it can just add to, to that with more tools and more, you know, fuel to the fire in a good way. So, um, I don't know. And I, I think when I think of it in the work way, I think it, I mean, the shirt that I'm wearing honestly comes to mind so much because like for us to some degree, like the physical side is somewhat easy. Like we're gifted athletes. So part of like the physical side of the, of the work can become, kind of uh, second nature to some degree, even though we're, we're spending a lot of time working on it, but like I've never experienced a level of strength and confidence as I have when I'm like able to like purposely intentionally step, step outside my comfort zone and like learn something and then like kind of come back into it with that new lesson learned. Like it grows that confidence. And like I said, I feel like I have experienced a level of strength and confidence um, from doing the inner work that I don't think I ever would have experienced if I would have just kept on chugging along with the physical approach. Um, so again, for anyone, I think it's an additive to your life instead of a full life reshaping from the get go. So um, it's a pretty empowering process instead of a deteriorating, uh, deteriorating process. Uh, there's a question in the chat that I'd love to just kind of touch on if there's time. So I'm just going to roll with it. Uh, so it's, what is your best advice for teens dealing with stress, anxiety, and doubt while trying to play sports? Um, so I think there's a, there's a lot there, but there are two things that I'd 
just like to kind of mention one, I'd encourage that teen or those teens to um, get off social media for just a bit, maybe like a 10 day break and see how you feel. I think uh, my husband coaches um, high school baseball and, and also runs a youth organization. And just some of these, these conversations that he's had with these players and that I've had with some of them, it, it gets pretty just wild, the expectations that they're setting themselves, that they're setting for themselves based on what they're seeing on social media and some of their teammates or other people at their school are doing. Um, and so I think it'd just be really beneficial for like a 10 day to two week break um, for that team, maybe right in the middle of season and that would be just a great way and it'd be be interesting to kind of track how that teen feels during that time and if any stress or self-doubt kind of goes um this actually leads me to my next point any stress or self-doubt kind of limits uh the second point is something that i learned just this off season and things that i reflect on this off season was the fact that the, i don't think the goal should be to try to eliminate like negative mental health completely or eliminate stress and anxiety completely because one it's just impossible it's always going to be there so and and two I think there's a lot of good that can come from a little bit of anxiety and a little bit of like we talked about earlier self-doubt and insecurities um so instead of striving to eliminate all of that completely learn to work through it. So for the teen that's trying, that's playing sports and experiencing stress, anxiety, and self-doubt, I think what's important is to, okay, like be very aware that you're going through it and experiencing those feelings. Now try to find ways that you can somewhat like limit it or um, work with it and see how it can make you a little bit stronger. Um, and sometimes anxiety is is a very good thing because it tells you that you're going in the right direction I think um you know people always say get out of your comfort zone and like magic can happen so perhaps that anxiety is just you stepping out of your comfort zone and that could be a really beautiful thing I'd love to piggyback on that um I would to to that teen I would say um who you're becoming is a lot more is so much more greater than what you're accomplishing. I feel like everybody on this call to a degree can say that checking off boxes and achieving goals that they had from a younger age didn't make them immune to uh, sadness or grief or um, not even wanting to live anymore. So I would say as much as we hold achievements in high regard, like think of it this way. Um, if you're gonna pass something down to future generations in your family. Um, I could pass them down my Pro Bowl jersey. I mean, they could have it and put it up on the wall and that'd be great. But something that's much more valuable to pass down is resiliency. Something much more valuable to pass down is, um, you know, calmness in the face of trials, like in acceptance of myself, daily practices that help benefit my health as opposed to take away from them just to hold up this image of I'm successful when really I'm, I'm dying and I'm eroding on the inside. So I would say just keep in mind that, you know, it's, it's great to be successful. We want to be excellent at what we do. Uh, we might as well while we're still living, but at the same time, you know, who I am and the person I'm becoming in the process is a lot more, a lot more important than the finish line or this destination. I think I want to get to because odds are you're going to get there and be like, this is all that it is when uh, the beauty from the journey all along. Very well said. Uh, appreciate everybody's participation today. Before we all wrap, I just wanted to highlight that little um, graphic behind Alyssa. So there's a, a crisis hotline and you should feel free to, to text 741-741 to reach a volunteer crisis counselor at, crisis text line, at the crisis text line. And this is a, an area for immediate support if you're in need right now. Um, and I think, think that's all we have for today. Really appreciate being here with everyone. Thank you, everybody. Great job, guys.